This is Deep Blue, where we get the true life stories of BYU athletes, coaches, and fans. Here's your host, Jerem Jordan. Normally on Deep Blue, I have this elaborate introduction of my guest because we already did part one with David Nixon. Go back and listen to that. This is a continuation of that conversation and what we call part two. David, welcome back to the program. Thank you. I, I'm glad we don't have to do the elaborate introduction. <laughs> we can just jump right back into this. Let's just go to it. Okay, we touched on some of the BYU days, but I want to explore that. I want to talk about the NFL. I want to talk about how in the world you got involved with BYU TV, which I'm super glad you did. Um, and I was a part of that in the beginning, which was fun. So let's go back to the BYU days. You played in what I call the great apostasy of BYU football. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple losing seasons there. You do go on a mission, though, and miss, you know, uh, one of those, two of those, right? Yeah. You play 03. Correct. You're on your mission losing for 04. season. Losing season 03, no, yep. bowl, no bowl game. Yep. And then 04, uh, another losing season. Gary Croton's out, the guy that you played for. 05, Bronco Mendenhall's in. And then you're here for 06 and 07. And away. Um, so let's talk about that freshman year. You talked about it was tough. You guys, you guys had a good team, which is interesting. I rarely would I say, yep, that losing record team was a good team. You guys had a ton of NFL talent on that team and uh, on offense and defense. Yeah. Why did that team not uh, at least go to a bowl game? I've always said this. Football, whether it's college or pro, it's all predicated upon the quarterback. And we didn't have a quarterback. Matt Berry got hurt that year. John Beck came as a freshman and struggled. He got concussed. He was in and out. I mean, we just didn't have a steady quarterback. And we've seen that with BYU in, in recent years as well. When BYU has their quarterbacks get knocked out, it usually doesn't lead to good things, all, unless your name is Baylor Romney, and you come in and you just perform <laughs> really well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was the problem with that freshman year, just quarterback play. Because defensively, I want to say we ended like in the top 20 defense in the country. Mm. Um, I mean, we had the horses just offensively. We just couldn't put up the points to keep up. I'm looking at the names on the defense. Aaron Francisco, Colby Buckwald, David Nixon, Brady Papinga, Gennaro Guilford, John Denny. Like, there are NFL dudes in there. Oh, Mania yeah. Brown. Mania Brown, yeah. Like, man, there were some good players. And then on offense, yeah, the, the quarterback play. Reynaldo Braithwaite has the longest rush in oh, history at San Diego State. I, right? I remember that, yep. San Diego State just down the sideline, ain't nobody catching him. Nobody so, did. Tom Kirkland said, he's picking him up and putting him down. <laughs> and it took me years to realize he's talking about his feet. Yes, yes. <laughs> And he was picking him up and putting him down. He, that guy was flying. Okay, what if I told you the leading receiver had uh, less than 600 yards? I believe it. That would be, yeah. uh, you know, room for uh, improvement there. Yeah. Well, and that was that was the that was the problem. The quarterback play, like I said, struggled. And and offensively, that's especially Gary Croden. That's the whole offense is meant to be West Coast spread offense, sling it, and yes. just and just air raid. And we didn't have a quarterback to do it. <laughs> so. So we struggled, and and frankly, defensively we struggled because our offense put us. I mean, we had we had short possessions by the offense, so defense we were strung out there on the field. Mm. To be honest, towards the end of the season, the three three five people figured out figured it out, and started game planning against it, and we struggled. I mean, you look at Colorado State, Boise State that year, we got demolished. Granted, those are good teams. They were good teams, but the three three five didn't work great against the run. You, you had, it was hard to be stout against the round with a 3-3-5 because you're basically bringing a safety down to be your other, quote, D-line slash linebacker, right, in order to create that seven in the box. Now it's a mismatch. Right? And so now you've got a, a safety coming down trying to go against a tackle and getting kicked out, good luck, right? And at the same time, the whole 3-3-5 is predicated upon confusion. So almost on every single play, one of us backers was blitzing. And frankly, the, 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 the safety was as well. Uh, and so if they ran opposite – of your blitz, you're cooked as well, right? And so it, it was a fun defense to play in because you were just – it was so unpredictable. But it was it was tough if you wanted to line up and grind it out with a team like Boise State and Colorado State. And when we faced those teams, they pretty much exposed us, which is why Bronco ended up moving away from us. Yes. Uh, he was a 3-3-5 guy. Yeah. Uh, went away from us. TCU had it forever. Yeah. They're like the last bastion of the 3-3-5. Well, and, and once again – no, Bronco didn't re- go away from it because it's a bad scheme. He went away from it because of the personnel. So BYU needs BYU is linebacker. You or linbackers. BYU is linebacker. You most of the time. Yeah, it's yeah. a four three now. That's right. Stocking. 
Yeah. Because well, he can recruit defensive linemen. That's right. It all, it all comes down to your personnel. And at the time, that's what Bronco had. He, he had so Brian he Urlacher. Safeties. He had Brian Urlacher in New Mexico. When you have Brian Urlacher, you can do whatever. And so, exactly. And so he, yeah. he was used to having that. That's who he recruited. When he got to BYU, he realized, oh, crap, that's not my personnel. I've got to switch it up to get more backers on the field, which is why he went to the 3-4. And so um, it worked out. Now BYU's at 4-3. So you just transition with the personnel you have. And frankly, even Kalani right now with the 4-3, if backers start to emerge as his playmakers, he'll go to a 3-4. It'll still look like a 4-3. You might have a stand-up linebacker of a DN. That's why Pepe, Tanuvasa, and others Exactly. And, and that's yeah, why yeah. this day and age, with nickel, you know, depending on the offense you're facing, whether it's a read option, whether it's a spread, whether it's a power team, your defense is going to change week in and week out too. And that's the whole point with spring ball, fall ball. You're going through lots of different looks with a lot of different personnel, lining up, figuring out four-man fronts, three-man fronts, five-man fronts. I mean, you've got to be pretty versatile in that sense, and that's what, you know, that's what it's all about. That's why for coaches, we always talk about adjustments, adjustments. That's really what the game is all about is, is adjusting to the, the offense and what type of personnel do you throw out there, how can you stop them, and what type of wrinkles can you put in within your system. And that's why you got to have players like Pepe with this year's squad uh, and, and Kyle Van Noy in years past, guys that can play up on line of scrimmage, and guys that can then walk back five years, five yards out the ball, and still be effective, get their reads right, and be able to uh, to play ball. How close was the O three team to being a bowl winning team? Because or a bowl clinching team? Because if Gary makes a bowl game in O four the next year, he's probably still the coach when you come back. Yeah, listen, I think Gary's problems weren't the wins and losses. I think there was a, the off the field yeah, issues. Yeah, there was other happened. off the field issues that were happened that probably led to his eventual departure. But, um, you know, I, I, I liked Gary. Gary recruited me. I still have a, a, a place in my a soft spot in my heart for Gary. Uh, in fact, he reached out just a couple, a couple weeks ago on LinkedIn or something. Um, I, I think he's a great guy. But ultimately, it was, you know, to, to be the head man here, it takes a lot. And it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough spot and, uh, with, with everything you have to juggle. And ultimately, I think it was it was better suited for a guy like Bronco to come in and, and kind of take the reins. Bronco goes through a transition, which I want to talk about in a second. But um, and you probably saw that pre-mission, post-mission. Like what? Oh um, three is a tough schedule, dude. You open with Georgia Tech, you get the win. Daniel Coates scores a touchdown. Does this like weird shimmy dance in the end zone, gets a penalty or something? Fun moment there. At USC, this is. Uh, did you play much in that game? And did you tackle Reggie Bush? I played most of the special teams. I or got like White. three or four defensive plays. And, uh, and yes, I, uh, I think I got some special teams plays. When, when we, I was in on the play when we got the safety. Do you remember the, we got a, Casey I'm on Bills? My, I'm, on, I'm on my mission, so I've oh, never you do, actually you seen any of these. Games. Casey Bills, yeah, we did a little stunt. Casey Bills came loose, knocked the ball loose, and, uh, and we got him for a safety. Um, to make it 21-2 to two in the second. Yes, there you go. But that game was weird because we actually had the ball, and we were driving – to, to take the lead in the fourth. Oh, wow. We, I, I, yeah, it's, it's 21-18 yes, in then, the fourth. And we throw a pick. And I, can't was, I can't remember if it was a pick six or not. But we throw a pick, they score. I think we force the ball again on offense, get another pick. I think we score again, and all of a sudden it, blows, it, it blew open. But we were, we were right there with them, 21-18, and we had the ball. A 4-8 and eight eventual BYU team yeah. with the number four team in the country. In there, and that four and eight was uh, that was a tough one because once again the Utah game that was a three to nothing year. Right? Yes, this is what I want to explore with this is how tough the schedule was, okay? Because yeah, Utah you mentioned, um, you you're going into the you're what four and five with a chance to make a bowl game. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you lose the last three. Granted, it's Boise State. This is Jared Zabransky yes. like sophomore this, year or this something. Is their right? heyday. Okay. At Notre Dame, yeah, that's tough. No matter even if Brady Notre Dame's Gwynn, crappy, Brady Gwynn, Thomas Jones, they're legit. Yeah, okay. NFL guys. The next year though, they come to Provo, move, um, and then you have Utah. Yep. That was a tough three to end the season. Yeah, yeah, and earlier we had Stanford, who that's when Stanford was still rolling. Um, and that was a close loss by four. Yeah, I mean it was, it was a tough season. Some of those games were close. Some of them weren't, like I alluded to with Boise State and Colorado State. Uh, but you know we 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 played pretty tough and throughout. The, Throughout all the games, and that's the thing too. I felt like this probably the best. You said we in a four and eight, right? Mm-hmm. That's probably the best four and eight teams ever come through BYU <laughs> because I felt like we had the talent. We really did. I mean, we we'll explore it in top five Tuesday on BYU. So. Yeah, the yeah, top four and eight teams. In BYU. That's that's next month. Stay tuned. <laughs> in uh, June, we're scratching. <laughs> no, it was a, that was a that was a fun year, and that was a 
you know, I, I look at me personally for my career. I had Coach Lamb. Obviously, Bronco was uh, the D coordinator. Coach Lamb was my linebacker coach. I'm fortunate because they knew what I was capable of because I played for them. I started, you know, uh, some games in there. So I go on my mission. I come back. I lose 27 pounds on my mission. Where'd you go again? I go to Quito, Ecuador. Um, I, I left. Rice and beans, lost it. Rice and beans. I got some, I got some weird bugs. That you got some bugs. Got some bugs that knocked me out for like a couple of days at a time. Oh, wow. I didn't get any bugs in Brazil. I felt lucky. Yeah, you yeah. were. You're very lucky. Yeah. And I, my last couple of months, I got a brutal one that I lost like 15 pounds. That I could not get back. That's so a I, lot when you're an athlete. Oh, yeah, huge. Or any, the whole time, anybody. I, but yeah. it, the whole time, I'm like, I'm sitting there tracking my weight, and I'm just, you know, in the blue, you know, just depressed because I'm like, especially pre-mission, every pound was crucial, right? I mean, that's back when I was pounding like four peanut butter jelly sandwiches, protein drinks. Protein, yeah. Yeah, you know, everything. <laughs> and so I come back off my mission, I show up, and the coaches look at me, and, and I'm like, 197. You look like walk on Dennis Pitter. Yeah, you look terrible. <laughs> And I, I've always said I'm so glad I came and played my freshman year because the coaching staff knew me. That like, okay, listen, we know what you're capable of. We know you can play. Uh, we just got to get you back in shape, get your weight on, get weight on you. And, and I got back in January, which was nice. So I, I got that back in nice. time to enroll. Yep. Um, and, and enroll for for classes, and, and I was able to start gaining weight. And within two months, at the start of spring ball, which was mid March at the time, I gained back all 27 pounds. What? Yeah. In two and a half months? Two, two, yeah, two and a half months. How'd you do that? Uh, I don't know if it was the best 27 pounds. I ate a <laughs> lot of Betos, <laughs> Rancheritos. Heck yeah. I ate a lot of those. Uh, and Cannon Center, you know, BYU gives you your, the card, the mill, mill card. So I was pounding a lot of food. But when I left my mission, they gave us something called La Bomba, the bomb. And it's one big pill. It's like a big horse pill. And you take it. What is this? And it kills. It's supposed to kill like every... Bug in you, basically. A bomba. Yeah, and I took it, and it did. I, I started. I was able to start gaining weight again, and it, I think it when you out. got home, they gave yeah. it to you. No, like as I'm leaving the country, like as in like the last day you. Oh, hug, your mission. Yeah, my mission. Yeah, gotcha. sorry. I thought BYU football. No, had... no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> la, 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 bomba. <laughs> I'm hugging the mission president, his wife, and they're like, "Here's a pill to take on the plane." They're like whispering, <laughs> yeah. get like under. Your Part sleep. of me is like, "Why didn't you give this to us before?" <laughs> You're like, "I lost <laughs> 15 pounds. You could have given me la bomba." Why did you wait so long for this? Uh, probably because they knew I was going to get more uh, insects, and more bugs in me before I left. I've never heard of la bomba. Yeah. This is fascinating. Yeah. Anyways, and it it came. It worked out. I got home, gained my weight. Uh, unfortunately, that that year because I gained so much weight so fast, I I also got thrusted back into training. I mean, this is so BYU. When I got off a mission, still wasn't great in kind of working guys gradually in mission, return missionaries. It was going too fast. Oh yeah, I jumped point. in. I was right next, to, right there, squatting with guys who've been squatting for three years. This right? would not happen right now. No, no, they do a much better job transitioning return missionaries in. Uh, much slower transition. They understand. I think, frankly, I probably take credit because I, I had. Oh, that year I ended up dealing with a torn groin and a hernia the entire season. Oh, wow. That I had to get shot up and taped up every single game, every single practice. Oh, wow. It was Every single practice? Every practice. They wow. had, they, they had a, a tape job to help me get through practice. It was, uh, I had inflammation in my pubic symphysis. I mean, there was there was all sorts of stuff going on. And That uh, phrase has not been uttered in the history of the Deep Blue <laughs> Podcast, and that is the first. Try to, trying to set records here. Uh, you said it so fast. It was because I'm not sure if that's actually how it's said, but I'm I'm just gonna roll. That's this. what I do too. If I don't know, I'll yeah. Just say it if there's any doctors out there, just just uh, just just tweet at yeah. Dean Nixon. Just close your ears on this portion, but no, it was uh, it was it was a wild deal, and and, and so it, you know I kind of paid for it later, but I got through I got through that my sophomore year 06, which was a, just a nondescript, yeah. low key season. Not, nothing BYU big history. happened in those six. No dramatic finishes. <laughs> no All Americans. No records. Uh, but I. But to that point, played that whole season, and we talked about this on the on, you know last podcast. Um, but not everybody gets part one, by the way. Okay, we can recap. It I must really one. like you. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate. It. Uh, but that game against the Utah, it was the end of the season, obviously. I was hurt by then, and I was coming. I was only playing like every other series in that game. Mm. And I was trying to do as much as best as I could. Um, Kelly Papinga at the time was rotating in with me. Um, but uh, it was 
at that part of the time, the season was a grind. By the bowl game, I'd had enough time for everything to heal up. That felt much better. But um, yeah, that was a, that was a crazy season. It was, I mean, that's just football, though. Right? Everyone, everyone plays with injuries, but that a hernia and torn groin. Not everyone's playing with those levels. Yeah, of injuries, it was right? it was kind of next level. Yeah, most okay. most most don't. Um, and it was crazy trying to get a diagnosis as well. It was just it was nuts. I look back, it was just you know the things you put your body through. And, and now I have a I have a little seven year old that wants to play tackle football, and I of course want him to play, um, and he will play because he loves it. But at the same time, I'm like, man, it's uh, you know, now that I'm 37, walking around, I've just got some back problems, and everything. It's like you, you put your body through a little bit of a grind to play this sport. But of course, I wouldn't trade for anything. I mean, the the lessons you learn and the the relationships and the doors that open and just everything about it, the experience itself was has been totally worth it. I want to ask you about that as a, a parent now and a former NFL player, which we'll get to your NFL stuff here in a second. But the, do you think in 50 years we'll feel differently about anything with football? Are the rules already catering to where it, we're going to be a little safer? Because obviously it's, it's a dangerous physical sport. It's part of the reason we love it, right? Yeah. Um, it's gladiator. But also it's, you know, CTE, it's yeah. concussions, it's, you know... Robbie Bosco can't bend his uh, left ring, yeah. right ring finger, you know, or whatever. Like, there's some ser- there's a serious toll there. Yeah. That the average person and who didn't play college sports, most notably football, which is extremely physical, don't deal with. So, you said it was worth it. Do you want your kid to play yeah. tackle football? Yeah. Because of everything around the game as I, well. I think the life lessons I learned, the coaching I got, co- you know, coached up on. I think it's hard. I mean, you. Especially football, I think of the time of the year, it's in August. And that's when you're doing your, your well, no more two days. But even the grinding of, of practice once a day in 100 degree heat. I mean, especially growing up in Texas where it's 112 plus humidity. I mean, the character building that happens there for, for these young men and the life lessons that are learned on that football field, like you can't replicate that. It's similar to what we talk about with missions, right? Mm-hmm. You, you want people to go on, kids to go on missions because. You can't replicate that experience anywhere else in this world. You can't do it. And it's the exact same thing I feel like with football in particular. I mean, I played basketball throughout high school. And basketball is tough. You're running, you're running wind sprints and run suicides and all that fun stuff. Not fun at all. But football, out in the heat, banging helmets, dealing with injuries. Like, these are things that learn you. You can't quit, right? I mean, there's no quitters. And, and, and the things you learn there I, have served me throughout my, my life as a businessman and and, uh, you know, help me get a jump start in life, help with this, you know, scholarships. I mean, there's, it opens all sorts of doors, right? And so uh, that's why I, I get it. There's, there's some health risk. I think, to your point, the game's changing. There's no question. The game's much different than when I played, right? And I think it'll only continue to evolve. Not only is the game changing, but the technology of the helmets, the technology of the pads is changing. Um, I guess the way I guess people would counter that is also the athletes are changing. They're getting bigger, faster, and stronger, right? And so... Sure. There, you know, it might counter that, but, but uh, you know, I, like I said, I think it's worth it. I, I think, frankly, probably the the uh, the care of these athletes as well, right? Like the rehab and things like that, probably better now than it was back then too. So people know how to deal with it, certain injuries when these kids come up with stuff, and so maybe they're going to be better off later in their lives than maybe my generation or even older generations have been. But it's a it's 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 a blast of a sport. I mean, and, I, and like I said, the lessons I think are, make it make it all worth it. Yeah, you're not like a Dick Butkus out here with no face mask or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, not, yeah, yeah, we we were fine. We were, it's we not were that old. Jeez. Okay, so 2006 is an unbelievable year, which we talked about in the first podcast as well. Um, you finished that year. You're 11 and two. Remember, this is coming off of three losing seasons. You were part of one of them. We talked about. Six and six and 05 was like, we're headed in the right direction. Your second year of your mission. And then 06 is like, boom, BYU's back. This is one of the best seasons in BYU history. Yeah. Like, I think it's I think it's a top five year because you guys dominated and the stats were off the charts and you blow out a power five team by 30 in the bowl game. I don't care what their motivations are. You won by 30. By the way, I was a, a what's called a pair ab or parabolic mic. I was holding out for ESPN <laughs> yeah. on the sideline. So it was really fun to hear the conversations um, on the field, some yeah. of which were uh, friendly, uh, others were not safe for work, but all good. So then 06 is great, but you lose 
John Beck, second round draft Curtis pick. Brown, Johnny Harleen, who if you play on ESPN, not the Mountains, probably an NFL pick, and so on and so forth. Lots of I Jake Caressa. We lose a lot of linemen that year. That old line, okay. Yeah. Um, you go into 07, and it's like, well, we'll see what we get on offense. Because yeah. defensively, you're back, Brian Keel's back, a bunch of guys. 07 was like, well, we'll see. Yeah. Little do we know, the winningest quarterback in BYU history is sitting there ready to have his turn. Little did you know. We knew what we had. Because uh, Max, the squad? Yes, because Max was ripping us up you in knew. the scout team. It, it, we, we knew what we had. We had full confidence in him because we, we saw him every day in practice. We saw his attitude, his swagger. Did he have it then? Oh, yeah. So yeah. he had played at Arizona State a little bit. Yep. Mission, a little partial mission bet to BYU, and then he couldn't actually play that year. There was some technicality. That's right. right. Yeah, and that's why he was scout team. But he was scout team. Would uh, he have been the backup if he could have played? Uh, you know, he's Joe, still pre- he, yeah, he, Jason Beck Jason, was pretty good. I think Jason, senior. because of sen- yeah, seniority probably. So third string maybe? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think seniority purposes, I think he probably would have been backed. Max was Jamie back Beck's him. listening to this going, hey! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't talk about I will like hear that. about this later. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I... But we saw Max, and you know he talked trash to us. Uh, you know, even as a scout team quarterback. Was that weird? No, no. I, I mean, we get right back to him, right? I mean, you only talk so much trash. You're, you're working off a card, like it's like, hey, dude, yeah, you know, they're telling you where to throw the ball. It's like you're not that good. <laughs> like, like, you can't talk that much trash. Um, but but you could tell that he had it. He had the it factor. Which is what? Which is all you want from a quarterback? You want a guy who's fiery, who's going to be a leader, who's going to be a captain, who's obviously got the intangibles of being able to, you know, as far as the ability to throw the ball, but those intangibles of of, of kind of leading a team and and you know, getting the guys up whenever things are tough. Like Max had it, and and so we knew going into seven, we're fine defensively. As you alluded to, we had all of our guys back. So we moved Kelly Papinga over to middle linebacker. He was he was outside backing up Brian Kill and I moved in the middle. Um, you know, to take Cameron Jensen's spot. Uh, you know, secondary-wise, we were loaded. Uh, offensively, we had a lot of guys back. Uh, we got some guys back. We, we kind of, Curtis Brown's gone, but but we're able to now have Fui, Manasse, uh, Harvey, right? I mean, because Harvey had had sort of this, he had played a little bit in like the Tulsa game, but mostly red shirt. But he's also another guy we, you know, we knew. And so uh, we're pretty confident, you know, going into those seven. Like, hey, why can't we repeat? And we were coming off a high, right? We're coming off, like you said, a bowl game where we smacked Oregon. Uh, we just won. We just won ten straight, right? I mean, you know, and so confidence was was all time high heading into seven. And you're feeling like, and literally, there was a uh, you know a documentary made like like BYU football's back or something. I can't yeah. remember exactly. What I actually had that DVD somewhere. Yes. yes, I remember that. I need to go watch that actually. About the 06 team, yep. it was like, yeah, we are back, baby. So then, 07, you start with Arizona. This is a repeat of the opponent, but at home, yeah. from the disappointing loss we talked about in Tucson. And this is a 20-7 to win for BYU, where it was never really close. Even though it was 20-7, to it was like, nope, yeah. you got them. No, you handled them. You guys are a very different team from a year ago. Yep. Willie Tuitama was a quarterback, and we uh, you would we, see him later at the we, end of '08. We, yes, we uh, <laughs> in the Vegas Bowl. We we uh, we faced him, and and no, I mean they, we knew they were an athletic team, um, but once again we were pretty confident, and we and we owed him one after what happened at their place, where we felt like we really let one get away there, and kind of spoiled what could have been one of those BCS type years, right? And I, I guess losing twice up front, '06 and '07. Mm-hmm. Did you ever feel like you still had a shot at the BCS as the highest ranked group of five team ever in those years, or was it like ah this uphill climb is probably? It was all. I think our our thing was always similar to how it's been during Independence. Like you lose you lose one, it's gonna be really tough. If you lose two, you're done. And, and we, we even felt that last year with BYU football. Yeah, where yeah. it was like okay, New Year's Six at large. Probably not. Yeah. Although it came down to it literally one yard with yeah. with Baylor Oklahoma State yeah. in the uh, yeah. 12 time. Okay, so you guys were like, well, let's just do what we did again. Okay, you go to UCLA. I, I go to this game. I'm on the sideline there. That was an unbelievable game yeah. in terms of Cougar Nation showing up. I think we talked about it in part one as well. At Tulsa was crazy. But you guys, again, start one and two. Yep. Are you just crazy frustrated again about that situation? Because you knew what you were capable yeah, of. Yeah, we were frustrated because UCLA, we felt like we let one get away there as well. That was a close game. And then we go to Tulsa, and we – they had a bye before us, and 
Mm. And they threw every trick and everything, the kitchen sink at us that game. And and later, I may have mentioned this, we may have talked about this on, on podcast number one, but uh, I, I played with their tight end um, who played for Tulsa. We, we played together in Miami. And I remember bringing up that game. And he said, yeah, dude, we had a bye before your game. <laughs> and we threw in like 20 trick plays <laughs> that wow. we were just hoping would work. And I swear on my life that they, they ran every single one of those trick plays against us. And every mm. single one of them worked. I remember, I'll be honest, that's one of the few games where I came to the sideline and Bronco was, he was lost. He, he didn't have an answer. And we would talk about adjustments. We'd come to the sideline and it's like, Keep your eyes on the guys. Like, they kept running wheel routes all over the place. They'd sneak guys out and run stuff. They were doing quarterback. They were doing the Philly special from 10 different formations. Like, it was the craziest thing ever. And <laughs> and we all were just head spinning because it's like every other play, you know, the problem with trick plays, and this is why offensive coordinators love them, is because it puts you on your heels. Like, now, now you're second-guessing all your reads, mm. right? And so even if they're not running a trick play, mentally you're, you're playing mind games like, this could be a trick play. So I can't commit to what my I think my read is because it could be a, a flea flicker. Or it could be another reverse for a bomb. And I've got to get into my pass drop, right? And so it starts to play weird mind games with you. And that's what happened that game. We were – it was a mess. And, and the offense, they, they held up. They, they were putting up points. We were going blow for blow with Tulsa. Yes. yes. In fact, that's the game where uh, – people probably heard this story – where Max Hall walked off the sideline. As he's walking off, he walks by Bronco and goes, "Are you guys gonna stop him?" And just keeps walking. <laughs> <laughs> and just keeps walking. And uh, Max throws for five thirty-seven. Yeah, four touchdowns, two picks. Yeah, yeah. I heard about that story later, and uh, <laughs> and that's why you know Bronco didn't say a word because uh, <laughs> there was a lot of truth to it. That was a that was a tough one. As a defensive guy, that was a tough that was a tough game. Really tough game. Yeah, that's why I brought it up. Uh, how many? I, I, I'd have to look this up. I don't know if I even can. Gregor Bell maybe knows the answer. A 500-yard passing game with a 100-yard rusher and 300, three 100-yard receivers. Yeah, I mean that's amazing. And, offense. You, and, you, and you lose. You gonna stop him? Or? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like, he's like, he's like you gonna stop him? Or he's like, you can get a stop finally, or something, so some snarky, <laughs> some snarky comment like that. But hey, he could talk the talk because he was backing it up. And then you guys proceed to win ten in a row. Yeah, you did it again. Did it again. Was there any rallying point to, to that, or was it just like, we, we did this last year, we know we can do it? I was going to say, I think a lot of it was we had a great case study from the year prior where we had run the, run the gauntlet. And, and you know, the good thing about the Mount West back in those days, you had some cupcakes in there that allowed mm-hmm. you to take a breath. And, and that's a tough thing about independence is these schedules, you don't have, these guys don't have a chance to take a breath, you know? And, and you know, back in the day, we'd have Wyoming. And especially those 06, 07, 08 years, Wyoming wasn't great. Yeah. New Mexico wasn't great. UNLV was not great. Yeah. And so you had a chance to kind of collect yourself, maybe nurse some guys, rest guys during games. You know, some of those games only played three quarters, you know. I mean, one quarter of play, that's a big difference, right, to let a guy rest. And so, uh, you know, and I know, I know coaches would never say this, but when you're playing some of those teams, I, the GAs, I think, are already game playing the next week's game, you know, getting, <laughs> getting everything ready for it. Uh, you know, there's there's some of that going on. So, I, you know, the, the Mountain West is much easier than Independence has been because Independence, it's, it's been back-to-back-to-back P5s, right? It's it, hard. And, and bye weeks have come late in the season, which will happen again this yep. year, you yep. know. And so Utah it, it, Tech. It just makes it BYU tough. TV. But, yeah, BYU, we were confident, um, and we just rolled. And, you know, of course, it took some – Fourth and fourth and eighteen. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the Utah game. So that weekend, uh, BYU TV, we go down and we do BYU men's basketball in Vegas at the Orleans. Little did we know we're going to camp out in there for weeks on end <laughs> in the WCC later against Louisville. BYU wins this game. We were scheduled to do uh, BYU Old Dominion the next night if BYU lost to Louisville. We were, that's what we thought would happen. They didn't. So the next night, because I'm thinking. This is going to be the first BYU-Utah game I missed since 95, except for my mission. I'd gone to every single one. There, here, there, here. So awesome. BYU wins the game, David. The next morning, we drive back to go oh, to the man. BYU-Utah game. So I get to go to this game, which is super exciting, personally. Meanwhile, this is back and forth. Um, and and you guys are in a position where you need one of the most amazing plays in BYU history. <laughs> what did you see on 4th and 18 from the sideline? 
So I will say this. I, I remember this. Um, I knew with Max, we were never out. You were never out of a game. Similar you to John. In fourth and 18? I'm telling you. Even with John, same type of deal, same type of approach. Like, I, I never felt like we're done. We're cooked here. Um, and so I, I remember sitting, you know, defense were on the bench sitting there watching the, the big screen, which has a little bit of a delay, uh, back, especially back then. And I remember seeing Max roll out, roll out able to step up in the, in the pocket on the rollout, and he heaves a ball. And I'm watching the TV screen. All of a sudden, I hear the whole – I see the ball in the air, and, and all of a sudden, I hear the whole crowd erupt, and you see it happen on the screen, like, you know, a second, half a second later. And it, we just erupted, obviously. And we were jumping up just going crazy. They eventually go on to score on that drive. Harvey Younger, the old – you know, the, the Harvey Younger just runs over Utah into the end zone. And then – we had to actually go back out on the field still. And yeah. We, they, this, I think there's a 20 some seconds, 30 seconds left. And we had to go back out and defend. And, they had uh, a Hail Mary throw. They had a Hail Mary throw. And I remember we were in the end zone batting that one down. But uh, that game was that game was nuts. And once again, th- that game decided the Mountain West Conference Championship. I mean, that's what was so fun. That's what will be fun with Big 12 is hopefully it comes down to games like that. I mean, there will be an actual championship game, which the Mountain West didn't have back then. But. Um, that's that's the blast of playing in a conference is that you know all the eggs are in that basket you know and and uh, that that play alone I mean when you go back and watch that film and think of a biting on a uh, you know a, a, it wasn't even a slant and go it was like it's just a, it's a double move Why right are you sitting at the stick I don't yeah, get it. It, it it's just it's it's mind boggling but thank goodness it happened <laughs> Max says especially Austin Collier like, I understand if you want to yes. if if you bite on somebody else for some reason but. To, to only have single coverage on on Austin, and the safety's not helping towards him. That's a part that's like, thank you, thank you. And Austin was awesome that year. Oh eight, he was like unbelievable. Yeah, uh, yeah. But he's still amazing in 07. Max, tell, Max tells the story that Robert and I kind of got flustered in the moment, and he gave him not a play call but like a formation. He didn't call a play. Yeah. So then Max just calls a play. Yeah. Max Max calls four verticals except Austin. It's like a stutter and go yeah. or whatever. Stutter and go, yeah. Stutter and go. Thank you. So yeah, that's just unbelievable. So um, you win that, and then you still play at San Diego State the next week, which is super weird. And then you know what's funny? I don't play even remember. UCLA. I don't even remember that. You game. just forget. The yeah, San I honestly State do. Game, right? That's it. That's the game at halftime where Max. Didn't spike it and then just ran it in himself. Yeah, at half. What was the final score of that game? Forty-eight twenty-seven. Yeah, it was blowout. Blow yeah. Okay, then it's the UCLA game. This is weird because you play the same team twice in a year. Same team, different look though. They, they, you know, Ben Olson has started game one. Brother Olson, who was actually my host on my recruiting trip, and still plays this day. Now lives here at the American Fork. I love that. Um, but he broke his foot, and so different look. Uh, quarterback later in the season. I think they had some injuries as well, which is why they'd fallen down to where they had. In the a classic ball. UCLA too. Yeah, started Hyped, off and then started, started off strong. <laughs> uh, but they had Bruce Davis, defensive end, who you know was a was an issue the first game and an issue again in the bowl game. So it was it was a it was a that that game, man. We wanted it so bad because of what happened earlier in the season, where we felt like we had, we had let one get away from us. And it, it still ended up being really close. We actually felt like we should smoke them, but as it always is, you know, it's no type of games where you feel like you're you're you should smoke them. You don't. And it all comes down to that field goal. And that field goal is wild because Jan Jorgensen and I line up in the same gap. It's kind of similar. Like we just called it block right. And it's like actually it might have been an all out block because you know if they throw a two point conversion. Or they, they, they slip something out for a touchdown. Who cares? That'd be quite, that'd yeah. be an onion like moment. Well, especially them, given yeah. their kicker, Kai Forbath, who is yeah. long you know, time NFL. Yeah. And so I remember we lined up, and, and Jay and I were in the same gap, which, no surprise, he won that battle. So he ends up his shooting through the gap. And I kind of fall behind him. And we, you know, the whole point on field goal block is you want to penetrate, and then you want to time your jump to try to get, to, try to get a hand up. And so we all time it, and Ethan Manamaluna is in the middle, and he gets his big paw right there on the ball. And I, so I hear the thud. You hear the kick, and then one second later, you hear the thud of the hand against the it ball. It was loud. Very loud. And I turn around to see the ball sputtering, and I see it fall just short of, of the, of the uh, field goal. 
And there's a shot on me at ESPN just jumping up and just fist pumping. I was, I mean, I was ecstatic, and it was, uh, it was amazing. That that was, that was quite the way to finish the year, uh, being those guys. When once again, it's another year similar to '06 where we felt like, you know, we could hang with anybody at that point in the season. Um, although UCLA wasn't great at that point, and we struggled with them a little bit. But uh, yeah, well, it was man, what a game. But once again, keep in mind Vegas Bowl again. So now this is the third year in a row, and I only say that because I'm foreshadowing for the 08 season. <laughs> yes, you are. Nice <laughs> transition into that. Okay, 08, the quest for perfection, I think, shows up in, like, fall camp or something. It's a phrase in the university mission statement. Bronco loves it. It gets suddenly applied to football. doesn't help when you make T-shirts. Um <laughs> Which I love seeing a quest for perfection. Team. I'm just <laughs> Still like out there. You, you, that's a baller. That's a that's a true Cougar fan right there. Uh, Were you guys weirded out by quest for perfection because now the pressure's on, or was it like, no, bring on the pressure? We've gone eleven and two two years in a row. You know, it's funny. I think the I think the public hyped that up more than we did. Like it's not, it's not like we looked at that as being like, oh my gosh, this is our mantra. Like we must quest for perfection. Right? Bronco was sort of leading the charge, but not you guys. Yeah, and keep se. in mind, Bronco every year had a different theme or slogan he went by. Right. Do you remember some of them? Uh, what, the 08 was going to, well, let's see, the 07 was the Band of Brothers. That's where the Band of Brothers came in. And there was a cool uh, media oh, guide poster with like that's right. a bunch of you guys. That's right. Yeah. And so we had shirts made with, you know, our, with Band of Brothers on them. Yep. When uh, was the Salt Flats pick? That was before my time, but there was a uh, theme that, that was like was cool. bur- burn your canoes. Uh, so there was a, uh, and as, this is while I, was, while I was on my mission, so I'll butcher this story, but it was, it, it's the Maori culture. That when they would go fight another island, they would when they when they came onto land, they would literally burn their canoes. No like, retreat. No retreat. We're not going back. We're, yeah, yeah. And uh, burn and the boats. It's that's right. Fr- yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was the same similar concept. I mean, that's what yeah. Brock was saying. Hey, no, no looking back. Like we're all in. Forward. I think that was 05. Yeah. and so I'm trying to remember oh six. Yeah, there there was a theme every year, and so it wasn't a big surprise to us when he's like, "Oh, quest for perfection." He when he explained to us, it was. The school mission statement. We're like, yeah, that sounds great. It, I don't know why. At least across, it didn't really cross my mind. Like this is, this is going to be portrayed as we're definitely have we're going, going undefeated. Yeah. But quickly it got brought up, and I was like, yeah, I can definitely see how that's the case. Uh, <laughs> and so we do. We the first half of the year we are on the quest, and, and we're cruising. Um, yep, you're six and zero, oh. and we're ranked at top number nine, number eight in the country. Yep, um, you go to play TCU, and you're nine in the AP poll. Yeah. Yeah, and then we just they run. end up seven. Yes, and we run into TCU with Andy Dalton, Jeremy Curley, Jeremy Hughes. They're unbelievable. I mean, they were uh, they were completely stacked. Well, think about that. Oh wait, year TCU is not even the best team in the league. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, it's not, Utah who finishes number two, beating Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Which you think about oh wait, I think that's not what that. spurred all those teams for TCU to then eventually break off to go to the Big you know, Twelve. Yeah, the Big Twelve. And this was Utah. the 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 note two year, two years before. Yeah. Every team that's been invited had some season that sort of validated them as a program, except for Hawaii. They're unique, right? Yeah. But every everyone like West Virginia and the Big East and what like those Big East teams made sense. Yes, TCU. Yes, Utah. Yeah. Boise State's the only team that's had some amazing seasons that has not gotten the invite. There's a lot to that demographic sure. location and so on. Although I believe Boise State's probably going to be in the Big Twelve at some point. Yeah. But um, that's interesting. You guys, you guys are so good in 08, and you're still the third best team yeah. in the league. So we lose TCU, go on, keep winning, and then we go to Utah. And I tell people that's... You have one thing. loss going into the Utah game. Yeah. And, and, and if I recall... You're uh, I think 16th, we, they're 8th. Yeah. And, and it, it's the it's the highest ranked matchup ever in BYU-Utah history. There you go. At Utah, huge game. They're playing for a BCS game. But had Utah beat TCU, or did TCU beat them at 08? I think... Utah went undefeated. Yeah, no, I know. So they beat TCU. I, yeah, they did beat TCU. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Of course. You're right. So, but I think because of that, man, I could be wrong, but I think if we beat Utah that game, we actually, we all three shared you the balance cup. Ti- yeah, the title. Yeah. With, with Utah. Because you would have had one last. Yeah, I don't know what the head-to-head, I don't know what the deciding factor was, like if there was an ultimate winner, if they figured that out. But Who would have gone and But yes, I remember thinking, hey, we still, even though we lost once to TCU, we have a, if we can beat Utah, because they beat TCU, we have a shot. At the Mountains Conference champions, co-champions, again for the third straight year, and we were right there going into the fourth quarter, 
and similar to USC in, in uh, 03. Yep. We were right there, and uh, and then Max, you know, forced the ball a couple times. We get a couple of picks, sixes, and and the, and the score looks much worse than it really yes. was. Yes, it's 27-24 in the third quarter. Yeah. You're down three. Yeah. I mean, we're right there. And think about it. Think about that Utah team. That's the greatest team they've ever had. Yeah. It's still better than the team that just won the Pac-12, in my opinion. That team was probably better. But uh, you could argue for 2021 Utah. I get it. But who cares about Utah? Um, okay, so 08, that's that's it. That's, that's, your, that's, we go, your, we go, that's 08. We go into a bowl game. Arizona, we face Arizona you're again. You're super excited to be in the Vegas Bowl. Yeah, well, that's why I mentioned earlier. Fourth year in a row. We, we, knew, <laughs> we knew exactly what all the festivities were. You were playing as a Power 5 before you were. BYU was power five. Pretty much. We're not motivated. Yeah, here. pretty much. <laughs> That's what someone said after BYU lost against UAB. <laughs> said, hey, BYU, you don't get it. If you lose to a G5, you just say you weren't motivated. Yeah, you weren't motivated. That's what power yeah. five teams do. Yeah, that's what <laughs> that's what Ohio State was doing before they played uh, Utah in the Rose Bowl like, We year. have like 10 dudes yeah. out. They're all NFL guys. No, I, that's honestly, the, the truth was that. And as a captain of that year, it was hard. It was hard to get the guys rallied and get them going. But um, ultimately, we they... I mean, Arizona had been to a bowl game in years, and so they came out just firing away. And it was a rough night, but you know, still in ten and three. So those last three years, I tell people I went thirty-two and seven in those last three years, which is which is a pretty phenomenal run with two Mountain Conference championships and eighteen to zero at home. Yeah, never lost at home, and that was that was a big deal to Bronco. I remember oh yeah. six, we go, we ran the Y, and we sat up there on top of the Y, looked down at the stadium, and he's like, "Listen, we're not going to lose that. We're not going to lose at our home. Like that's our place." And for my next three years, we didn't lose there. Yeah, if you That's actually go to 09, I don't know how they did in 09 after I left. 09, they lose to Florida State and TCU. I don't. Yeah. Yes. They Florida beat St- Utah. Yes. They beat Utah. In overtime, home. amazing. But, T- yeah, the Florida State one was disappointing because BYU climbs into the top 10 yeah. after two weeks. Yeah, that's right. Beats Oklahoma. Then TCU, game day shows up. Yes. And it's like, whoa! And then TCU did a TCU yeah. thing again. Yeah. So I was like, oh. So when they left to the Big 12, it was like, good, get out of here. <laughs> but then we were like, eh, this is boring. Yeah. So yeah. Let's now, go. now it was kind of sputtered from there. Would you have been drafted after 08 if BYU was playing on ESPN? That's a golden question. Uh, listen, I, I, you know me. I, I, try, I don't like to toot my own horn or anything. Um, I, I think I probably would have had a pretty good shot. Yeah. And, and the reason being is because at my pro day, all my numbers I put up would have been like top five amongst all the linebackers at the pro day, at, at, at the combine. Then you're guaranteed my bench to be press, a bench press, my 40s, my three cone shuttle, everything, <laughs> everything I felt like would have been would have been up there. Um, so yeah, I feel like I I from my understanding what my agent said I was right on the cusp of getting invited um, but, to the combine to the combine. But yeah, that the uh, the mountain was tough. You know that was a, that was a tough time. It was just no exposure. You know we've already talked about where my family couldn't even watch me play, and when they did, they couldn't even figure out which one I am because it was so grainy. <laughs> it was, you know, and, and, and that was back, Brian Keel back then. It was it was an upgrade to play on Versus because Versus had HD. They had an HD. Team. Yeah. Yep. And and yep. but even Versus was terrible. Nobody yep. nobody got that either. So that was a dark time as far as exposure. Um, which I, I think for sure probably had an impact on, on the next level. You know, I think for, for everybody, not just me. I, th- I think for, for all BYU athletes, uh, football players. I, I, mean, I think even Brian Keel. You know, I think Brian, he, he ends up getting drafted, but I mean, he goes higher, you know. And so, but, you know, what it could have should is. You know, yeah, I, it is what it is. So you end up playing for several years in the NFL. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Start out with the Raiders. Start with the Raiders. So, so, so draft day. Um, it's, it was interesting. Starting the fourth round, I start getting calls from teams. I got calls from the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I remember this because you know this was, this was big deal uh, to a kid at coming out of college. Jacksonville Jaguars, the St. Louis Rams, the Oakland Raiders, and the Houston Texans. So they're those, three of those four will connect with you later, right? I'll eventually play for. Yeah. Um, wow, that and, draft day really matters. They oh, remember yeah. you. Oh, they remember you. And, and, and they, they put you away. If you don't go with them, they put you in their system and they watch you. Mm. And so, sure enough, I was getting calls from, from each, from, from linebacker coaches, some D coordinators, no head coaches, but D coordinators, um, starting in the fourth round. Hey, we're taking your next pick. We got your next pick. You know, Texans roll around, boom, selection, cornerback out of Alabama or something. And he called right back, back, man, I'm so sorry. We want to take you. This guy was still on the board. 
We have a big needed cornerback. We got you next round. So next round, we round roll around. And this happened with all four, four or five teams, right? So you're thinking like twelve times. You're yes, pick? it's it's agonizing. Oh wow! And and finally the draft ends, and I don't get picked. And how are you feeling right then? Yeah, you're pretty. You're feeling pretty pretty low. It's like man, I really want to get drafted, but we don't have much time to mope because the free agent market. Once teams get when the draft is done, now all the power shifts to the players. So you go from getting drafted, you have to go wherever you get drafted, to all of a sudden, as a free agent, you pick where you want to go play. And so now my agent and I are on the phone, and he's fielding calls from these teams, being like, hey, we want to sign them, and as, lo- as well as all of his other clients he has, right? So it's just a hectic time. And, Crazy. and we, we're going through the rosters of each team and looking at the linebackers on their current squads and figuring out which guys are older, you know, which, which guys are at the end of their careers, which ones aren't major contributors. Assessing who, fit. Assessing fit, who's getting paid. There's a lot of things, you know, there are a lot of factors going into it. How much money's out there? If a guy's not getting paid much, then there's a chance that a rookie could come in and beat him out. But if the, you're paying him $10 million bucks, good luck. So after all that assessment, I, I of course, loved Houston. That's my hometown. Uh, and the Texans were, were pushing hard. I had done some pre-visits with them. So before the draft, they teams flew me out. The Raiders and the Texans uh, flew me out. And I, I got to meet all the coaches and everything like that. Um, I was really close to going to Houston, but ultimately the, uh, my agent felt like the best fit was probably Oakland, given, given how they – he felt like their interest and the, the age of their linebackers was, uh, were kind of two deciding factors. So, so I, we, get, we get back to Oakland, let know that, hey, we're, <coughs> we're doing this. Uh, let's go. And uh, they fax over and fax. They fax over. Maybe you're they, old, man. You know, actually, maybe they mailed it. They might have overnighted it, but we we agreed to terms. Yeah, and uh, I signed it. And uh, back then, it, it might still be this way, but like the next week or two weeks, it's we're off and off to minicamp, and you're off and running. So fly out to Oakland and uh, get the helmets. They drafted a line. So the funny thing was, when I went to go train for the NFL, I went down to California, LA, to train, and you train. I trained with like 20 dudes. One of which was LaShawn McCoy. <laughs> uh, and there were a couple, I'm trying to remember, there were some other guys that got drafted high, as well as a kid that played linebacker slash DN at Oregon State. And he was my buddy. He was like my close friend there. His name's Slade Norris. And, and we were buddies throughout the whole time. The Raiders take him in the fourth round, <laughs> which I thought was crazy because this here's my buddy I trained with. I knew him super well. And so when I decided to be free agent and go with him, I'm now ultimately basically competing with him for a job. And we stayed really good buddies. We're roommates, you know, during camp and all that fun stuff. Um, and and so we go in, do all mini camps, OTAs, all that fun stuff, training camp. Uh, get cut on the very last cut, and they signed both me and him back to the practice squad. And this is back when only eight guys were on the practice squad. Now they've they've expanded it. I think to almost double. And so it was rare to have two linebackers on the practice squad. So on the practice squad. Um, Fortunately, I ended up kind of beating him out to where about halfway through the season, the Raiders brought me up first onto the roster, and then I played special teams the majority of the rest of that season, just kind of special teams guy. So what was your first game? It was the uh, at home when I got called up. And this happened like on a Friday. Or no, it was Saturday. It was, it was the day before the game. And the team's like at the, already at the hotel. And they called me and they're like, hey, you come in, you know, come in and sign. We're bringing you up to the 53. <laughs> Which is a huge day, right? And just coincidentally, one of my buddies here from Utah was that was out there already. He was going to come to the game and just hang out. Um, and so, I suited up that game and and I'm trying to remember if I suited up or if I was inactive. But anyways, I was elevated and and on the fifty three. And it's pretty rare for them to bring you up on the fifty three and cut you again. So I figured I was pretty much good for the rest of the season, which I was. Um, so, yeah, play the rest of the season with Oakland, and I I become really comfortable with our system. And the coaching staff. So I go through a whole off season with Oakland, uh, with the Raiders, and I roll into training camp feeling pretty sure. I mean, I I done OTAs and felt like I was doing really well. Um, I felt pretty confident. I knew, like I said, I knew the defense. I had a really good training camp um, and had some off season uh, preseason games against the Cowboys in particular, where I played pretty well. Was, uh, that, was that weird to be playing in an NFL preseason game and like, hey? What's going on? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. Those for a guy like me that's on the fence, that the preseason is that that's your Super Bowl, right? And so, the tough thing about that is you go through training camp and you're exhausted, 
right? I mean, they're grinding this back when two days are still around. And the problem with preseason games is that you don't game plan for the game. They literally, the day before the game, maybe two, they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're playing Cowboys like in two days. Um, <laughs> here's like, here's some, here's like some couple plays, here's some concepts they run, uh, and we'll walk through them today. They don't, your training camp, you're still focused on yourself. You're trying, you're trying to get your own defense installed. You're not worried about these preseason games, right? But which sucks for guys like myself that were on the fence because you're like, no, I need to know. I, I want to scout these guys so I can pick up tendencies and I can, I can understand what they're doing offensively and scheming and so I can play better and, and move that much faster, right? And so you're already be kind, of, kind of behind the eight ball in that sense. Um, but, yeah, when, when played well uh, and at the very end, also the last cut, I thought I was actually – I was right on the – I knew I was right on the cusp. I thought I was going to be good to go. And they um, – I got called in, and the, the D coordinator called me in, which was rare. And he Did goes, you know at this point? No. Uh, but they called me in on cut day, which means you're getting cut. So I knew something was going on. But I, I figured he just let the head man do it and just be good. But the D coordinator called me and goes, listen, this wasn't our call. <laughs> the big man upstairs, which at the time was still Al Davis, uh, Al has a guy who's uh, still on the roster that him and him and this player linebacker were really close, and they both went to the same college or something. You know, obviously much different times, but yeah. they had some. And Al was always that way. He, he had his guys right, and which I couldn't fault him for. But they're like, listen, you're gonna, we're going to bring you up on the roster within like a week or two. Like you're 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 coming up. Just just you know, we're going to put you back on the practice squad tomorrow. You're going to be good. And I went to Tom Cable, head coach. He said the exact same thing. So I was like, you know what? That sucks. I really want to make the roster day one, opening ro game day roster. But, you know, it is what it is. And I'd been practice squad the year before, so it wasn't a big deal. So I go home. Uh, I go back to my apartment that, that night. Once again, I'm not married. So I'm just kind of just moping a little bit. Um, and the next morning, I wake up at like 7.30 a.m. to a call from my agent saying, hey, you just got claimed off waivers by the Texans. Pack your bags. You're going to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. And he says, you're going to get a call from Houston here in like 10 minutes. And so they call. And uh, you can stop me if you have any other questions. But in fact, I'm just rambling at this point. But no, they, I love it. They call and they say, you got to fight at like 10 a.m. We need you down here now. Like, because this is now you're getting into the, this actual season, right? This roster are being, are being set. Um, can you pack all your bags? We'll ship your car down here. Pack all your bags, put them in your car. We'll get your car down here. Just bring like clothes for a week, you know, for a week or two. <laughs> and so I proceed to run over to SFO. <laughs> I left my car at my place. Sure enough, somebody came and got it at some point. And I fly down to Houston and I'm, I'm off and running with the Texans. And, and that's how fast, wow. you know, stuff happens in the NFL. Um, so go with the Texans. Lo and behold, they brought me in. This is the year Brian Cushing. Got caught with PEDs, so he was um, he wasn't uh, he was available for the first four games. So I come in, I play mostly all special teams. I was inactive a couple games, um, kind of filling in. You know, I'm still learning the defense. Who the defensive coordinator? Well, the defensive assistant at the time that helped the linebackers was a guy named Robert Sala. Oh, <laughs> so me and Coach Sala spent a lot of time together. He's now the head coach for the Jets. Yep. Um, coach wow. Coach Fred Warner at the 49ers. So him and I spent a lot of time together learning the defense. Um, I'm playing strong side backer. And and so we, we're grinding every night after practice. We sit around for another couple hours, you know, cramming the playbook. And then comes the game against the Kansas City Chiefs. And guys were nicked up. Cushing was still out. And the day before the game – one of our guys had some hamstring issues. He was still working through. At the hotel, all of a sudden we find out that only four of us linebackers are suiting up, which is – it had never happened in my career where you only have four guys suit up. Minimum What's normal, six? Normal six. Sometimes you do five, but you always have six usually. We only got four. And I'm just all of a sudden kind of starting to sweat bullets. I'm like, so if somebody goes down, I'm in. <laughs> and I'm still learning this defense, which is much different than what we ran in Oakland. Um – and I'm playing. I'm doing Sam linebacker, strong side. So I'm like, okay, here goes nothing. Sure enough, I'm playing all the special teams in the first half. I remember this game. This is the first time they opened up Reliance Stadium too, the dome. So it's hot and muggy. And 
playing a ton of special teams. Already tired from special teams. Right before halftime, the last play of halftime was like a Hail Mary from the Chiefs. D'Amico Ryans, who's now the D coordinator for the 49ers, goes up to bat the ball down, tears his Achilles. And so we go into halftime, and coaches are like, we're down our captain, middle linebacker, for the rest of the season. So it's already, you know, everyone's depressed. But by the way, Dave, you're now starting the second half at linebacker. And not only are you starting, but you're starting at Will Backer. Not Sam that you've been studying this whole time. <laughs> you're starting at Will. And they knew that I was, I mean, they, they knew they were putting me in a really tough spot. And they said that. They're like, listen, we're going to call a very basic game. But, you know, you're going to Will. So basically that whole second half of that game, I played uh, see ball, get ball is what I did. I just ran around <laughs> and I was making tackles. I didn't do a great job of being run fits or anything. And I ended up being, the, I think, the second or third leading tackler in that game for our team. Um, we win the game, but they, the Chiefs put up a ton of points on us. Back when they had Dwayne Bow, I think Matt Castle was a quarterback at the time. Mm. So I, I might be wrong on that. but um, And so we go... After the game, you know, we won. Like I said, everyone's stoked. Come to the locker room. Everyone's high-fiving. Bob McNair, the owner, comes up. Dave, great job. Head coach, great job. Everything, you know, everyone's happy. I'm on the radio. I'm just like, what is going on right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the next day, Monday, we go in to watch the film. And, of course, you know, the film looked pretty bad because I was just – I literally was just doing my own thing, you know, just, just running around making tackles. And in NFL, that's a big no-no. You got you know, you have your proper run fits and everything. So they they uh, weren't thrilled about that. That's also when Brian Cushman was, was now cleared to come back. And so the day after that, so two, the next day, Tuesday, they ended up cutting me. <laughs> oh <gosh. laughs> Like just boom, boom, like that. Wow. It went from being like the high of high to the low of lows. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was it was it was a crazy ride. And. Uh, and so I got cut, and then I go on. I get picked up by the Rams. They had me come be on their practice squad. I get brought up to the roster a couple of games later. I finish out the season with them. And then the next year, I mean, I can keep going. Then, then to, I'll finish my NFL career because it stops pretty close to that. <laughs> uh, 2012, this is now 2012. I go to training camp with the Rams. This is the year of the lockout. So all the, there are a lot of guys who couldn't practice. Um, all of a sudden, all those guys – are able to, the lockouts lifted, and they had some restriction about free agents and stuff when they could practice and stuff. So they come back. They actually, the Rams cut me because they signed a whole bunch of free agents that year. I get picked up. I go do a workout with the Dolphins, and I get picked up by the Dolphins. Uh, by the way, this is a funny story with the Dolphins. I think I told you this before, where they're working out me and one other guy from Baylor. And like, we're going to pick one of you. And so we're both working out super hard, super hard. And all of a sudden, at the very end, after like an hour workout, they're like, they have their, their videotape right there. And like, okay, I need both of you guys to walk out to the 20 yard line and please take off your shirts. And we're like, what? <laughs> we take off our shirts and they're like, okay, now turn around. And they filmed us with our shirts off because they wanted to see what our body looked like. <laughs> like we were like a, a cow, basically. We were a piece of meat that they were just videotaping. That was like the last thing they wanted to see was, was how we looked. Uh, and uh, apparently, maybe I guess I look shredded, I guess. I don't know, because I ended up getting, I ended up, uh, they ended up signing me and not the other guy. <laughs> and uh, so I go to Miami for three weeks. Training camp is, training camp's, you know, nuts in Miami. It's hot, humid. I get cut on the last cut, which wasn't a big surprise in Miami. That's, I mean, if you're coming to training camp late, the Ryan's on the wall. Um, I don't get picked up the rest of the season, and that's, well, I don't say the rest of the season. I get picked up the first, like, six six or seven weeks and that's when I started you you hit me up uh, about doing some BYU TV when I came back in town um, and so I started doing becoming an analyst on kind of the kickoff mid season mid season yeah I, one of the things I, is, yeah I came in like a week or two late or something but I started doing it for four or five six games and all of a sudden I get a call from, which by the way I had gotten to the point where I was like you know what I'm probably not getting picked up again like I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of over this. I'm I'm done. I stopped working out. Like I I, I was probably doing we work out like once a week, not like every day like I was whenever you know. Yeah, all. tip top shit. And all of a sudden, I get it, my agent calls like, "Hey, the Rams want to want to fly you out." Well, here's here's the best part about it. The Rams mm -hmm. played the Cardinals on like week eight or something. 
I was actually at the game watching Keel. Brian Keel was on the team. It was, there I'd was flown a fan. Down, I'd, as a fan, I'd flown down to Phoenix with some other buddies to do like a guy's weekend golf and everything, hanging out. And we went to the game to watch Keel. And I saw their, one of the linebackers like pull his hamstring and go out. And I didn't think anything of it. I was like, no, that sucks, you know, whatever. I, once again, I was kind of checked out at this point. I got my, I'd, I'd been in the league for two full years. I was kind of ready to move on. And uh, I fly back home that next day, and my agent calls and is like, the Rams want to fly in and work you out. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> I haven't been working out. So I remember flying in. I knew all the coaches because I'd been with them the year prior. And the GM, all of them were there for my workout. They worked me out, and I'm just sitting there. I'm out of shape kind of. They're like, take off your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been bad. I think they would have been like, get out of here, please. Uh, but I'm sitting there doing these workouts, and like I turn my back to all the guys because they're all standing there. There's like four or five head, co- head coach, um, GM, DC, defense coordinator, and linebacker coach, the four guys, all sitting there watching. And every time I turn my back, I just like catch my breath, right? I'm like, I'm, I'm gassed doing these drills. It's just me and him. Like, at least yeah. the Miami one, it was two of us working out. They were just working me out. They'd worked out another black, uh, uh, his name was Chase Blackburn. They worked out another backer right before me. And so it's funny, I'm gassed, and I'm like, that did not go well. I mean, <laughs> but they told me just to wait in the player's lounge, you know, just for a minute. And sure enough, I get a call from my agent. And he's like, they're signing you. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, this is, this is awesome, but I'm not prepared. I haven't been working out, right? Don't worry, the next morning we go in, special teams uh, meeting, and I'm starting on every single special teams. <laughs> and we're, and I, my mind's just blown right now. I'm just like, what? where am I? What's going on? Uh, and, and probably the coolest story about that year was that week we go play the Cleveland Browns. This is the year that we were 2-14, and 14, the Rams. We sucked. We were terrible. This is coming off the prior year where we, we went and played the Seahawks in the last week of the season. On Sunday Night Football, whoever won that game went to the playoffs for the NFC West. Um, and? And we lost. Seahawks went that year in 11. So 12, we were, we're much worse. We went 2-14. and 14. But we go to – one of the wins was we would go and play Cleveland. They're equally as bad. But we're down late in the fourth quarter, late, like six minutes left. We punt the ball. I'm on punt team. We punt it away. Josh Cribbs is their returner, gets it on his own 25, 30 yard line. And I'm flying down and he out of shape, David out of shape, flying down the field. Just playing ball. He Josh Cribbs goes to make a move on one of our other guys. And I see him expose the ball a little bit. And so I go in and I punch the ball out. And he fumbles it. We jump on it, recover. Our offense I think went three and out, did nothing. But we kick a field goal <laughs> and we ultimately end up winning twelve to ten or something like that. I, I, the score was super low. I go into the locker room. Steve Spagnuolo, who's the head coach, gives me the game ball. <laughs> <laughs> gives me the game ball. And I'm just like, just once again, mind blown at this point. We get back to St. Louis. They have another like official game ball they presented me with. I'm special teams player of the week. you know. Um, and I proceed to play the rest of that season, start all the special teams. And, had, and I, I had actually a pretty good season, um, special teams-wise. I actually graded out, like, the highest among special teams players that year. And uh, it all trades back to that, to that game. And so uh, <laughs> it, was, it was wild. And I'll, I'll, I guess I'll end my story. So I, I apologize for listeners that I've just been rambling. I, I'm loving that. <laughs> so that end of the year, Spagnuolo gets fired, right? Um, but I thought I was going to be okay because I, I had good film being a special teams guy. You're like, well. I got a game ball. Yeah, guys, I'm yeah, on the I'm squad. Fine. But I, I, once again, I graded out really well, and, and I, I, I had done well in tackles, flags, and everything. Well, Jeff Fisher gets hired, and he hires my old special teams coach from the Raiders. So my special teams coach, it's actually, uh, let's call him Bones, um, Fossil. Uh, what's the dad's name? Jim. Jim. Jim Who Fossil's son. Utah too. That's right. Jim Fossil's yeah, yeah. son, we call him Bones, uh, was the special teams coach. He calls me. Bones like, on the Raiders is perfect. Yeah, it was awesome. And he's a, he, one of the greatest dudes I know. He calls me. He's like, Nix, I just saw you're on the roster. I just, I'm a new special teams coach. You're my guy. You're going to be like my special teams captain this year. He's like, I've heard this before. Yeah. And I was like, sweet. I was, I was just super pumped. Two weeks later, <laughs> agent calls. 
they're releasing you. Oh. Not only are they releasing you, but they cut like 20 of us all in one day. Jeff Fisher came in. This is pretty typical. Came in, just clean house. Like get Unless you're getting paid over like a million bucks, you're out of here. <laughs> I'm starting over. Got to implement a whole new culture, all that stuff. Yeah. So I was pretty bummed. Um, I go, uh, I go, I don't get picked up again. I get invited to some tryouts. One of those being the Carolina Panthers. I go to this veteran slash rookie mini camp with Luke Keekley there. And I was the only veteran they brought in for linebacker wise. So I'm sitting there in this room with a whole bunch of rookies for three days. And Luke Keekley, who's their number, I think number nine overall linebacker, uh, head's just spinning, right? I mean, just trying to pick up his defense. So me and him sat in the back of the room and I was kind of helping him coach him up, be like, listen. And You're he, coaching Luke. Keekley. I actually, I mean, he was, he, the guy was obviously very capable, but I was trying to calm him down. Just, yes. hey, this is what we do. We go out, do walkthroughs, and you wouldn't know what to do. And I'd be whispering to him, like, hey, we got to shift, right? Like, you know, when the, when the, when the tight end steps back, the whole line's got to shift, all that stuff. And so it was, it was a fun three days. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that is because I think the coaches took, took notice. And uh, they go, hey, we're not going to sign anybody today, but we'll keep you guys in mind for the future. And, and, the, and my linebacker coach kind of like winked at me. And I was like, I don't know what that really means, but okay. <laughs> and the reason I mentioned this story is because this is like in May. I'm dating my wife. At the time, my now wife, uh, we decide in June that we should get married. And I kept thinking, man, those Panthers, like, there's, I think there's a chance I get brought back because they, they're, you know, I think there was some mutual interest there. So my wife says, okay, let's get, you know, we decide, let's get married. And I said, well, there's only two day, there's only two times we get married. Either one is cut day, which the entire NFL has off in September, or um, I, we have to wait till after the season. And so she was like, well, let's get married in September. So I eventually do get picked up by the Panthers. They call me the day before training camp opens and says, we want to sign you, which is also not a great sign because they're kind of bringing you in as a punching bag, which is fine because it gets you more exposure in film. So go through the whole preseason. The week of my marriage, uh, it's now Tuesday. We have a preseason game on Thursday. I've got to fly to L.A. Friday to do the whole marriage stuff. The I, whole marriage yeah. stuff. I go into Ron Rivera's office. I got request a meeting. I go in and say, hey, coach. So a little bit of an issue here. I, uh, I'm supposed to get married <laughs> the, uh, this Saturday. Do you mind, like, after the preseason game, if I can just fly out and uh, go get married? Uh, and then I'll fly back if you guys want to keep me. If not, then great to, great to meet you. You're asking week of. Yes, week of. I mean, I didn't know what to do, right? Right, right. And he's like, yeah, no problem. He's awesome. Great, dude. He's like, no problem, Dave. Thanks for, you know. You've been great. We'll see what happens. So ultimately, I go, I, I fly out to LA. Saturday rolls around, our actual wedding day. And on the way to the Los Angeles Temple, I get a call from an agent. You just got released. Oh. <laughs> Which actually was a little bit of relief because I was so beat up after training camp. I you were had, okay with it? Yeah, I was actually really okay with it because I was, I mean, it would be nice to go back and play, but I had a honeymoon to Hawaii plan. I was tired. I was getting married. Actually, I don't know if there was a better time to, to give bad news like that because mm. I was uh, something fun was happening in my life. So I tell people the day I got married is also the same day I lost my job, which is always a fun yeah. fact. It's, it's a fun fact. Yeah. yeah. It's a fun fact. That is. So the rest of that season, I don't get picked up. Um, I just get into commercial real estate, which is what I do now. And uh, at the end of the season, a couple teams call because once again, you expand your rosters back from 53 up to 90 once the season's over. So they sign people to what's called futures contracts. And I had a couple teams call, one assignment to future, a future contract. And I just said, I mean, there's – because I could go through a whole process all over again. Because what people don't know, you don't make any money. You make basically pennies during the offseason and in preseason. Preseason, you get paid two grand for all of preseason. Mm. It's terrible money uh, for how much work you put your body through. Right. Um, and I just said, no, I'm, I'm good. And by that point, I got the three years, which got my pension and health benefits, all that stuff. And I was like, I'm, I'm good. And that's when I hung up the cleats. So, um, yeah, that's my NFL career. I probably went way too far in depth with it, but it was a, it was a wild ride. Everything from the Texans falling out, you know, well, getting picked up off waivers by the Texans, having to fly out there quickly, to balling out, to getting cut, going to the Rams, you know, third year, I'm, I come out for a workout. I mean, I go out there and, and become a special teams player of the week at game balls. It was a, it was a <laughs> wild ride, but along the way, tons of great friends. I actually ran into Ron Rivera two weeks ago. I was out at Pinehurst golfing, 
Nice. I ran into him and we uh, we caught up. He recognized me. And we we caught up for a little bit. But uh, that's awesome. Anyways, the NFL absolute blast. Crazy business, as everyone knows. Um, you know, I, I don't miss it one bit. People ask me, do you miss it? I say, no. I, I, I love that I wake up in the morning. My body feels good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, some other people might say differently, but, um, you know, it's it was it was quite the run. And then we pick you up again on BYU TV soon thereafter, right? Yeah. Because I remember talking to you being like, hey, what's your situation? You're like, well, I'm going to the this team and this team. Yeah. And I was like, all right, just let me know when you're done. <laughs> yeah. So it was right. So I did partial 11. Yeah. And I think I came back uh well 12 I think I think Jan Jorgensen came in at 12 and then and then so I didn't do 12 and I came out back but, 13 but then I came back in 13 and I've been and little do you know we're just going to watch your future brother-in-law play yeah well I did yeah I, I had no for idea those either. who don't know your yeah. sister Emily married Taysom well and we watched my other brother-in-law Craig Bills Craig Bills is an awesome dude too who, who who were the ones Craig and Rachel my sister were the ones that set up my sister Emily with Taysom that's awesome, so full dude. circle there. I but. love Craig. Covered Craig in high school yeah. with Spencer. Absolute absolute beast. Yeah. He's uh, awesome. Kevin and the whole family, they were great. Well, that's wild, man. What a journey you've it, been on. Absolute journey. Uh, and like I said at the beginning of this, football has brought it all. And, and, and you couldn't replicate this outside of football, right? And we all have our own journeys, but um, I think, you know, they're, they're all unique and different in their own way. But uh, this one with being cut and picked up and just bouncing and you know, the whole college stuff, dealing with injuries, uh, different coaching staffs, right? I mean, I changed from Croton to, to Bronco and um, just ups and downs and, and wins and losses and just life lessons all learned along the way. Well, it's awesome to have you on BYU TV because you're just a cool dude and a good dude and you've seen and been through the ringer and now you're going to help us bridge the gap from Mountain West to Independence to Big 12. Unbelievable. Wow. I mean, it's, it's so exciting to think of what's on the horizon, right? I mean... To, to be able to broadcast and have have Oklahoma State and Cincinnati, Texas Tech, those guys rolling into Lavelle Stadium week in week out. I can't wait to lose to Kansas in basketball. It's yeah. going to be great. Yeah, we're just hoping to keep it. We're just hoping to cover the line or something on those yeah, games. Yeah, just we're, cover versus Kansas. We're, we're, Occasionally, we'll get them once or twice. Yeah. Although, you know, listen, we set up at Gonzaga and we've done we've done some true. crazy things with Gonzaga. It's true. You never know. You can still make the tourney and not win the league. Well, yeah, TCU. We're TCU used to wasn't this. TCU like nine and seven this year in the Big Twelve? Oh yeah, Iowa State was like five hundred ish as well. <laughs> like, yeah, no, if BYU goes five hundred in basketball, we'll be ecstatic. Which, by the way, I'm a huge in, BYU basketball fan. If, you, if I know if people have noticed, I, t- I, I you I actually tweet. called a game as an analyst oh, or two. I don't know if we need to bring that up. <laughs> uh, that was very unprepared for that, and that was wild. But I love me some BYU basketball. I. Uh, I've told you before, but I think my wife has mentioned she thinks I get more frustrated with BYU basketball losses than I do football. with BYU football ones, which is probably true. Which is probably true because basketball, you never know what the outcome is going to be. I mean, it could change in the last two minutes. Football, you kind of can prepare yourself emotionally. Yeah, like we're down by twenty-one with five minutes left. That's you're That's, not coming. It back. ain't happening. It's not happening. unless Jim McMahon's there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, unless Max Hall and it doesn't help Mary to Austin Collier or something. Yeah. But you can kind of predict the outcome. Basketball, it's just such a wild ride. But, it's fun. Uh, it's, Great sport. But it's fun. It's fun. I, I have a little. I have two little boys who I've indoctrinated with just pure BYU. They've got chants about how BYU is great and Utah's not. And it's just <laughs> they tell it to their friends, uh, and it's great. Um, but they're it's it's fun. It's going to be fun to have a whole another generation of little little Cougar fans growing up. All they're going to know is BYU in the Big Twelve. Yeah, they won't even remember BYU in the WCC. You know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. And wow. And, and you know, my seven year old, he. He knows his football. Like he's he's all in, and so he's nice in basketball. He came down the other night after we lost Washington State, you know, because the game went late. He's like, "Hey, what happened?" You know, that was his first question in the morning. Oh, they lost, and he was kind of kind of defeated. But You're like Michael Flowers went off. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't stop some, him. some guy that we couldn't stop at all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's fun. It's it's fun being part of this BYU family, and I think back to that decision. You know, going back to podcast number one, we talked about with recruiting and where where I could have gone and. And the, the choice of, of me picking BYU, I mean, I, I don't regret it one bit. It was it was a crazy ride uh, playing football here, now doing with BYU TV, being involved, uh, and the relationships, everything I learned here. I mean, everything you take away, the network that I still tap into to this day. I was going to say, I don't think kids understand when they're making the decision where to go, like how influential BYU can be on your life. This yeah. isn't a four-year period. This is a lifetime thing where you're going to be super connected, your sport's going to end. 
you're going to have this wealth of amazing people in business or wherever you want to go. It's, it's We can help get you out there. Huh? Social media, BYU TV, BYU, like that. I, I didn't understand it when I came to BYU, what opportunities I might even have, just yeah. not even playing sports, right? It's awesome, man. It's, come come to freaking BYU. It's going to be great. I told, I had a recruit call me. His dad, they, they knew some mutual friends. And so they said, hey, would, would you mind filling this call from a kid that's looking to come to BYU? Um, and just talk to him about BYU and, and your experience. And I said, yeah. And I, I told him just that. I go, the the network that, that I still use for business and the, the relationships, everything I have. Uh, you know, I've talked to Blaze. I've gone to other universities across the country and and they don't they don't tap into it like the way that that a lot of these athletes have. And I said there's a huge support network post football that I think even BYU does a better job of now than they even did back in my day of setting kids up for you know jobs and opportunities down the road. So um, yeah, it's 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 super unique and it's uh, it's also I think an environment that can't be replicated either is is BYU and, and what they can do for you post uh, football and, and kind of post career. Well, David, thanks for the time, man. This is fun to get uh, two full podcasts. In yeah, here, bro. yeah. So, I, sorry, I took up a lot of time talking about my glory days, Mr. Uncle Rico here, but uh, <laughs> it was it was a blast. You could throw that football over the mountain, okay? <laughs> All day. Okay, awesome. That'll do it for us. Listen to previous episodes on the BYU Radio app or where podcasts are found. For David Nixon and producer Adam Woodall, I'm Jerem Jordan. You've just listened to Deep Blue on BYU Radio.